you really need to talk to the folks here at Next Level. I've got to tell you, just speaking to the people here, they are fired up, they get it, they've got the right balance, and they're all increasing their income, they're increasing their production. But you're dealing with uh, people that are in the trenches, dealing with this, our practitioners, had failures, had successes, learned from it, and it's about helping you, not just like get through the next month, but it's about creating legacy business for yourself. And I can tell you that uh, you are mission focused, I know you're purpose focused, and, and I can tell you that every loan officer that I've communicated with uh, that's been part of your platform has been a raving fan. This is the Next Level Loan Officers Podcast, a proud founding member of the Real Disrupt Podcast Collaborative. You can check out more awesome podcasts at realdisrupt.com. And now, Kenneth Travis and Sean Zalmanoff. All right, and welcome, welcome to the Next Level Loan Officers Podcast, the number one downloaded podcast by loan officers for loan officers. Uh, what an honor. And uh, listen, gang, I'm joined today by my partner, Mr. Shane Kidwell. Uh, Shane, welcome to the studio. Welcome, guys. I'm excited to be here. This is going to be a good one. This is going to be a good one. In fact, I would probably rank this uh, as maybe our one of our most downloaded podcasts. I'm just I'm putting that prediction out there uh, into space. I just know that it's going to happen. So listen, um, we've got an amazing guest uh, that's going to be joining us today. And uh, I'm guessing if you're a loan officer, if you haven't been living under a rock uh, for the last couple of years, then you are very familiar with this gentleman. But if you haven't, let me just give you a couple of quick stats not that he needs an introduction, but listen, you see this guy on CNBC, he's on Fox, and, and most importantly, he is a three-time crystal ball winner uh, by Zillow and Pulsenomics for both, or for 17, 19, and 2020. Uh, what an amazing honor. And listen, if you're an MBS Highway user, you know how valuable this is, you know how uh, accurate uh, he is, but without any further ado, let's welcome uh, Mr. Barry Habib to the studio. Barry, welcome. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate you. Appreciate what Next Level does for people. It's amazing to see the results you get from people. It's uh, it's it's an incredible program. Well, thank you. Thank you. And listen, we've got uh, we have a large audience that that listens to this podcast, and these are loan officers who may be newer to the industry. They may be seasoned veterans, um, but they're all come here to get great information. And uh, you know, as we interact with loan officers, obviously, the number one question, the thing that's on everybody's mind right now and that they're hearing from their borrowers, they're hearing from their realtors and, and amongst each other is, is kind of based around the market. And it's this you know, this idea of a housing bubble. So here we are, it's mid-May, things are hot. We watched your morning update this morning. You guys are talking about how everything's pricing over asking uh, 2% nationally, which is incredible. So talk to us, give us a little information about that, what you think um, and, uh, and where we're at. It's a great question. It's something that people are uh, hearing in the media, the CNBC a few weeks ago dedicated a whole day to housing bubble concerns. Diana Olick's been wrong about the housing market for nine years, continues to do so. So when we unpack this, why are people saying that? Well, prices have gone up. So the first misinterpretation is that the median home price is up 17%, but that's not appreciation. That's just a mix of home sales, less inventory on the lower end, more inventory on the upper end, although it's still slim on the upper end. And that shifts the mix of homes. Now, appreciation is still pretty robust at 12%. So that increase has people thinking back to, well, when was the last time prices went up and what was the result? And yes, indeed, there was a housing bubble. But prices increasing do not mean that there's a housing bubble. You know, you, you, you look at you know, things like the stock market or any commodity, you know, uh, well, if, if Bitcoin went from a you dollar know, to $10, you might say, oh, that's a bubble, right? Well, not when it's at, at 40,000, okay? So you know, this is... Uh, we, we have to put it into context of understanding what are the fundamentals that are driving this. So back in the early 2000s, we were very bullish on housing. I was one of the big housing bulls that would come on all the time. But then something happened in 2006, where while everybody was still pretty bullish on the housing market, I was one of the first ones that said, look, I've been a big housing bull. I know it. I admit it. But there's something happening here. And we felt the housing market was changing. In fact, you know, I actually took mortgage market guide and sold the business. I just felt that there was things that I was uncomfortable with in the industry that were changing. And a lot of it was based on demographics and those demographics were being hidden. 
I don't try and overcomplicate it. I make everything based upon the law of economics, the basic law that where's price discovery, it's based upon supply and demand. If there's more demand and less supply, prices tend to go up and vice versa. So up until 2006, we had seen some balance in supply and demand and they were pretty good fundamentals. But in 2006, builders went crazy. They built more homes than they had ever built before. So that's your supply side. So supply increase. So the only way the prices wouldn't go down is if demand would increase. But at the same time, we knew that demand was going to drop in that year. And the reason for that is because the median age of a first time home buyer is 33 years old. So if you look in 2006, you subtract 33 years, that first time home buyer in 2006 was born in 1973. In 1973, abortions were made legal. And if you look at birth rates, they dropped dramatically. So we knew come around 2006, there would be much less people forming households. And at the same time, builders went nuts. So we thought that imbalance would be problematic. Now it was masked because lenders came out with very creative products. Uh, there was a lot of investors in the marketplace. That was the time of fog up a mirror, here is your loan. So we knew that that was just kicking the can down the road, but inevitably it would happen. And while we were a little bit early in 2006 and everybody thought we were crazy, mm -hmm. I used to get hate mail when I used to go on CNBC and say, do not do these negam loans. This and that, you know. But when it eventually started to unfold in about the middle of 2007, you know, we knew it was going to escalate because once it became evident that there was an imbalance there, it happened. So people draw the conclusions that this is the same thing. After all, it's not that long ago. I mean, you're talking about what, 14 years ago. Yeah. So it's fresh in people's minds. People got mm -hmm. burned. No such thing. There is too much demand and not enough supply. Supply is not coming on the market. Let regulation, land limitations, cost for land, can't find labor. People are being paid 17 to $18 an hour to stay home. And not to mention the price of lumber has gone up 300%. So when you combine all of those things, it is a difficult environment to provide supply, especially where it's needed on the lower end. Now, the demand side, let's look at those same demographics, birth rates rising, rising, rising. But guess what's going to happen over the next three years? It will be reflective of what happened 32, 31 and 30 years ago, where birth rates skyrocketed. And I mean skyrocketed. So we're going to get an influx of people. Building is not keeping up. And if you just took a look at supply and demand, we're seeing the laws of economics come into play. Now, one other thing that we have to remember is people get confused on affordability. So they think that affordability because is, is not there because you went up 12%. Now, income's got to go up 12%. Look at hourly earnings, which are only up 4%. But you could pay people more or less hours or their shift changes that could account for more hours during the shift change. All that mixes into what you should look at, yet nobody does, is weekly earnings. That's up 7%. While there's still a disparity, you don't need them to be equal because you don't use all of your income. You use a portion of your income for principal and interest. On average, according to Fannie and Freddie, about 20%, not counting taxes and insurance, 20% for principal and interest because principal and interest will be affected by interest rate and loan amount. So sure. when you take a look at homes, if that home went up 12%, interest rates are actually cheaper now. But even if interest rates were to go up a quarter and match where they were a year ago, well, then your payment to reflect the 12% increase in purchase price would go up 12%. Because you only use about 20% of your income to cover principal and interest, a 12% increase in price, if interest rates stay the same, has to be met by a 2.4% increase in income. And incomes are going up at 7%. So wow. it's not affordability. What we are seeing, though, is we are seeing shaving off of the home ownership rate. Mm -hmm. If you take a look at areas like California, which for a very long time have been expensive, you say, well, how can this continue? And yet prices seem to continue to escalate. The national home ownership rate is 66%, but it's less than that in California. It's been shaven off. And what I want you to think about is envision a pie. And if that pie were 100 people, 66% of those typically buy a home. But in areas where it's very expensive, it will be less than that. So if 55% or 55 people are trying to buy 30 homes, even though the home ownership rate dropped, the home value is going to go up. And sure. that's what's happening. And that's what people don't understand. There's not enough homes for supply. So we do see home values continuing to go up. Our forecast is about eight and a half percent. So while it's hard wow. to get in, get in. And you referenced this morning, uh, the, the sale to list, it's never been this high. It's usually a discount is what you get. But right now, yeah. if you're listed at, you know, $100,000 on average across the U.S., not just in hot markets, it's selling at 102000 So it does suggest continued price appreciation, although it's difficult. Well, Barry, that was, I mean, guys, we just had a knowledge bomb drop there. So if people were taking notes, they had to change pencils three times, get a new eraser. 
I, I love this. And I live in a high price market. I mean, Seattle has had a low inventory, a supply and demand issue, basic economics for years. And so we've seen that here locally. And I, I love the point about California and the percentages because we're seeing that play out. And so then as, as, a, as, a, as a loan advisor, as somebody who is a certified mortgage advisor, we have to think differently in how we look at our clients, what we're doing to give them that buyer's advantage, that edge. How do we educate our real estate agents? That's really the challenge for those of you listening to this call. Knowing that information is one thing. What do we do with that information? How do we take that information to help leverage our buyers? Because now you need to have more buyers to close the same amount of loans because there's so little inventory. And we're seeing that more applications are converting into less loans. And so people have to think differently. And that's something that Next Level has always talked about is think differently. Go where the puck is going. Don't go where the puck is. Great points. You mentioned this a little bit, but I, I want to just briefly touch on this because we didn't ask Barry Habib about where interest rates are going. Our audience would be pissed. So you touched on this a little bit. And obviously rates are still extremely low compared to over time. Just give us a, just a brief kind of summary of, of where you think they're going as, as best as you can with what's changing so, in the marketplace. Yeah, it's a really good question. And I know that rates are historically low. We all, we all say that, of course, but we do have to keep in the back of our mind that that low rate now has to buy more debt because prices have gone up. So while the rate's down, um, it doesn't feel like that same rate would have felt with lower prices. So there is something that you have to adapt for when you do, to be fair. But that said, uh, we think that the forecast longer term is really good. I see a recession coming in 2022, 2023. The stimulus will wear off. It always does. Last October, we got $2.8 trillion in stimulus between CARES Act 1 and 2 in March and April of 2020. By October, GDP had already slowed down to a trickle. We had 2020's GDP was 4.3%, but in the fourth quarter, it was a meager four-tenths of a percent. So you get this big flurry, and then it wears off. And what's left is the debt, which slows economic growth. Probably be the same thing in 2021. That's why you know the current administration is trying to figure out what they're going to do for the next shot of adrenaline, the next steroidal hit. And they're already trying to plan that because I think they're full aware that as they head into a year where it's going to be a congressional election year where you typically lose seats for the party in power anyway, they don't want it to be very damaging based upon slower economic conditions, which they are smart enough to know is going to happen. That's why they're figuring out what could we do here. So when we look at the stimulus that we've had, chances are by the fourth quarter, we'll start to see the effects wear off. And slower economic activity means lower pricing pressure, which is lower inflation. And that's the key because inflation drives interest rates. Now, over the time being, over the summer, when it's not going to be the banana rama song where it's a cruel, cruel summer for interest rates, but I think there's some upside pressure there. I think mean, the 10-year will challenge 175, maybe gets as high as 2% because we're going to get increases in inflation. And it's going to be, at that point, a little bit more persistent. The Fed's thesis of transitory is going to be challenged. There is going to be a lot of evidence and concerns that we are in a position where that inflation has to now, over time, erode the fixed payment you get like you do on a mortgage. So investors, those who invest their money in mortgages to give those to people in order to combat the higher rate of inflation, which is now eroding their return more rapidly, will command and desire a higher return. Now, I don't think we're going to go crazy here, but yeah. I don't think it's unreasonable to assume we could see about a three-eighths increase in rates. So, so you know, just like you guys heard me, you know, when I used to come to the next level events back in 2019 and 2018, what did I tell everybody was that, hey, look, we're going to have a great refinance opportunity. So don't pay points, don't pay upfront MI, pay monthly MI, even though a lot of people say it's not a good idea. And while everybody's chasing the lowest rate, do not do that. Look for lower fees and take a higher rate to the extent you can in exchange for that at a reasonable level because we felt that you would not have those mortgages. And we tried to point that out and isolate that. And it played out almost exactly. We said, early 2020, you're going to get a recession. You get the 10-year treasury at 1%, set it live at all your events and everywhere in the media. And everybody thought it was freaking nuts. I remember Rob Crispin like made fun of me. He said, ah, it'll never happen. <laughs> and let's remember, we hit those targets in January yeah. of 2020, two months before we had any kind of lockdown. So uh, it was th those, those items were already, that was going to play out. And I see a similar scenario playing out maybe in 2022 or 2023. So what does this tell us? The seeds you're planting today above 3% there tomorrow's refinances. So as you talk to your customers, there's two approaches. One is, hey, look, uh, don't be butthurt because the rate's over 3% if it is. And so oh, I've got to wait for the rate under 3 sure. Look, If you could save money now, do the calculation for them. Figure out how much money they saved now. And then even if in a year from now it gets to under 3 which it may very well be, 
how much did you lose by not saving today? And then that incremental savings, how long would it take to make up the amount that you could have banked today? It's likely in the neighborhood of four to five years. So that's probably a bad trade. That's probably a bad bet. So you should do your loan today. Don't worry about the emotional target of below three. And then the other thing is, it may be advantageous for you to bid a little bit more than asking price because over the summer, prices are going to go up. And there's a good chance, in our humble opinion, that rates move up a little bit too. So you get a double whammy. Maybe it's better off to go a little bit more over asking price, but we, you have to evaluate that we do that as well. And MBS, how we've created that is the hottest tool we have right now is the bid over ask tool, which finally answers the question, which has never been done before. If I bid over asking price, how long does it take until the home catches up to that? Right. And therefore, I can correctly evaluate whether this is amount. Maybe it gets me the home, but if it's a bad decision. So people say, is there a housing bubble? No, there's not a, a broad-based housing bubble, but you could put yourself into an individual housing bubble. If the house is 400000 and you bid, and it's being asked at four fifty, and then you bid five hundred, and then we look and we see it takes four or five years before that house gets to 500000 that's probably not a good idea. But if it might take four or five months it probably is a good idea. So we at least yeah. help you evaluate that. Well, and I was going to give you a, a shameless plug earlier, Barry, about the bid over ask tool, because that, you know, as we mentioned, when we opened the show, we're active loan officers. We're in the trenches with, with everybody else. And it's a tool that my team uses on a day. I bet we get five requests a day for uh, updated, you know, properties and things like this. And, and I'll tell you, and if you're a loan officer and listen to this and you're not an MBS highway subscriber, you should be because we are winning deals based on that product alone. And I, I mean, hands down, that being the reason that these folks are willing to maybe put a little more money into the deal, get a little more aggressive on the offer because they realize, well, I'm going to, I'm going to get my money back in, in eight months, in 12 months, you know, and I'm in Dallas, Fort Worth, which is hot, hot, hot. And so it, it moves quick. Um, so yeah, it's a great tool. If you're, if you're and not by using way, by the way, Kel, to be fair too, maybe it's going to show you those instances, you shouldn't do it. Absolutely. And it has. You know, so mm -hmm. just like all of us as good stewards to our customer and good sure. financial advisors and good fiduciaries. Now, I don't originate loans anymore, but there was, you know, for over 20 years I did. And there were those times where you told that customer, you probably shouldn't do this yes. or it doesn't pay to refinance. or it you, you made those discussions with those customers cause a bond for the future. And, you know, and you felt good about them, even though you didn't get the deal. You knew you were doing good and you knew you're doing the right thing. So we can do that for people too. If it's going to take you seven years to break even, please think about this before yeah. you do it because it might not be the best thing for you. Well, well and, and, and this really comes back to being an order taker right. versus an advisor, right? And I mean, another tool that we use, you know, people say, oh, the refis are gone. We use the debt consolidation tool like crazy. Refis are not gone. There is a massive group of people that can still qualify for a very good low rate, relatively speaking. And the beauty of that tool, and this isn't a shameless plug for MBS Highway, but it's almost impossible for it to not make sense to consolidate your debt right. with that tool. And so I would just challenge the, the group, be an advisor, educate people, spend the time to do more than send a fee sheet. Like if you're that LO who just sends a fee sheet, a robot's going to take your role in the coming years and you'll no longer have a job in the industry. Well, you're saying you, you bring up something that you know, to use a sports analogy, it's take what the defense gives you, right? So, you know, what is the defense giving us on the refinance side? The most equity we've ever had in homes, the lowest right. loan to value, the average loan to value in the United States is 37. So there's plenty of equity in homes for the most part. People have MI in many cases, so we yep. can eliminate that. And in addition to that, this is the highest level of consumer personal debt that we've had all at the same time. So when you put it together, it's kind of the defense is giving us debt consolidation, but it's more compounded than that. If you do the things like you two do and like you teach people on next level to do is to truly be an advisor, then what you're doing is you're not just saving the money. That's one part of it. But then what are you doing with the savings? If I can keep my clients payments the same as they're making now that they're happy making now, take that, that windfall, that bounty of additional cash flow, and maybe they keep a portion of it, but take some of that and either build it into the mortgage, reduce the term, and then and then you know exponentially benefit them because then the rate gets reduced or yes. say you have a full voluntary ability to do that and show them the magic of that and now save them 12 14 16 years of mortgage payments that becomes the best retirement plan in the world because if i've got 170 months without making that four thousand dollars worth of payments it's not just the mortgage it's all of their payments because you've consolidated their debt 
Now that customer has the best retirement plan in the world and then the equity that they built up acts to take care of their kid's college. So what did I do for that customer? Your payment remains the same, but I've fixed your two biggest concerns. How am I gonna retire? And how am I gonna pay for my kid's college? And I haven't changed my payment one bit. So it's, it's almost like a magic trick. And what do you think is going to happen after that? Okay, thanks for taking care of my retirement. Thanks for taking care of my kid's college. But can you do a little better on the rate? That doesn't happen. <laughs> you don't go to a doctor's office and they save your life by finding something that's a lifesaver. They say, yeah, but can you charge me a little less? You don't yeah. do that, okay? Yeah. You don't negotiate price with your surgeon. Right. So you, you, you respect what they're charging you because the advice is so much more value than the cost. And, and that's what we need our customers to look at us. And, and, and guys, I want to talk to everybody right now because we're coming off a big year of 2020. For many people, a record-breaking year. Mm -hmm. And what I don't want is the defeatist attitude. Oh, that was a great run or that's a, that. You can continue to do that. You just have to shift your focus. And what I want people to understand is a couple of concepts here. And the concept is that you can achieve nonlinear growth if you make the decision to change your focus and alleviate points of friction. I'm just going to say it one more time. Shift your focus to achieve nonlinear growth by alleviating points of friction. And, and just understand this conceptually here. And I want you to just think about this deeply, please, watching this, because this could be one of the more important things that, that we, we discuss. We want to grow because let's face it, you either grow or you die, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we don't want to be shrinking here. We don't want to be in a market where we're shrinking. There are headwinds. Fintech's taking a bigger footprint and you feel it now. The purchase market is hot, but transactions are fewer. And there's more hands in that pie trying to steal them from you. Refinances, if rates do indeed go up, we're going to be in a little bit of a, of, of a more challenging situation. The mortgage industry used to be the best kept secret out there, right? But now it has become more in vogue. So a lot of influx of people into our industry, it's growing. That's healthy, but it also means more hands in the pie. Sure. So what do we have to do? We want to work smarter. Yeah, we want to work hard, but we want to work smarter too. I believe that if you can understand the concept of alleviating a point of friction, you achieve nonlinear growth. So I've said that. So what, okay, if you, so linear growth, imagine a staircase, go up one step at a time or taking a step. So if I take 20 steps, I went from one side of my office or home to the other. Mm -hmm. But if I take 20 exponential steps, I go around the world twice, okay? That just, just understand the concept of exponential growth and nonlinear growth. I want you to think about the S-curve. So if you're not familiar with the term S-curve, S-curve means like your business does this and then nothing seems like it's going on. And then all of a sudden you alleviate a point of friction and it starts to do this. We had that in 2020. 2020 gave us, our business was doing good. And then all of a sudden rates dropped and we had this, no point of friction to refinance for anybody. You didn't have to be a rocket scientist. And then all our businesses did this. And then you get the other part of the S, where then you achieve a plateau and it flattens out. So what you want to do is you want to build an S curve on top of an S curve, okay? Mm -hmm. So you want to get that exponential level of growth. So as we think about this for ourselves, for our own personal growth, the best way to do this was is with alleviating points of friction. So I did this as an advisor in my mortgage business and it made my business skyrocket. I start doing one loan at a time. I started piecing together the loan I'm doing for you today with the next loan I'm going to do. I started understanding the markets and scripting and rehearsing. When I found that most people had a difficult time with rate lock situations and getting burned by reprices, that was a big point of friction. So what did I do? I created Mortgage Market Guide, was the first of its kind and experienced nonlinear growth. I alleviated a point of friction and I went up the S curve. Then... As I, you know, as we kind of went went into some difficulties in the marketplace and I sold that business, what did I do? When I got into the healthcare business, I noticed that people during imaging would have the anxiety. I hope that nobody here has to go for a scan. But if you do, you know, the tech sees the scan. They know what's going on, but they don't tell you. Oh, how does it look? Oh, I can't tell you. You have to wait for your doctor. What if you have to wait for your doctor four or five days? The anxiety makes you crazy. So I said, why do people have to do with that? That's a point of friction. Every point of friction becomes an opportunity. So I said, let's alleviate that. Put a radiologist in. It cost us a little more, but then we grew that to three practices. People loved it. For the first time after a scan, I'm sitting with the doctor five minutes later. And if it's great news, I walk out of there to celebrate. If it's not the news I wanted, I have a plan and I stop the anxiety. Mm -hmm. And that's all people wanted. And that business exploded, built it to three offices, sold it. Uh, when I had Rock of Ages, Rock of Ages, I would see, and this is going to sound funny, but I would see that on Broadway, it was not allowed to have drinking in the seats. And I would watch people come into the theater and people would come in and it would be late. It's in Manhattan, they dress nicely. 
and then they go into wait online, they pay 16 bucks for a drink, and then they get the drink in their hand. It's like, okay, the lights flicker, the show's about to begin. So what am I gonna do? Sit there, miss the show and have my drink, or leave the drink, or what most people did is oh, 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 it was, it was, this is not enjoyable. I was like, why do you have to make people do that? Well, Barry, that's the way it's always been done. Well, that's not a good answer for me. Okay, that's a point of friction I wanted to alleviate. So it took me a while, but I became the first show in the history of Broadway to alleviate that point of friction. Rock of Ages exploded. People have a great time. And now every theater in Broadway allows it. So I'm very proud of that. Wow. Leadership that was able to do by alleviating a point of friction. With MBS Highway, what do we try and do? Well, we try and alleviate points of friction every day. There's a lot of bid over ask situations. Let's create a bid over ask tool. Refis people are waiting. Let's create that comparison so they know not to wait and evaluate for them. People have a lot of equity. Interest rates might go up. They don't have their college and they don't have their retirement set. Let's create the debt consolidation tool. People want to get on social media. People say you got to create videos. They don't know how to do it. Let's create a point of friction. Let's alleviate that point of friction and create social studio. So we'll give you the script. We'll turn your computer into a telecom. And every single thing that we do, this is the way we do it. And what I want you to do while you're listening is do not look at problems as problems and don't bitch about them. Figure a way to alleviate that point of friction. And I promise you, you will achieve non-linear growth. You will have explosive growth, not because the market handed it to you and you caught a wave. You make your own wave. You make your own S-curve. Notice the points of friction. Think about them. Seek advice from those who have been there. Learn, gain expertise, and make the best investment you can make. The best that people say, okay, Barry, you're all, in, all involved in all the markets. You've got all this technical analysis. What's the best? What What do you think of Bitcoin? What do you think? What do you, by the way, I like it. But um, <laughs> the best investment you can make is right here. It's the best investment in the world. And your words are your best tool. Mm. Being scripted, being rehearsed, attaching yourself as closely as you can to these guys at next level who teach you how to do those things. This is what we need to do because we have to kind of be polished and be ready because the key word here in sales is to be effective. Mm. Here's the thing, guys. Why can't you produce $200 million a month in loans? Why? Because you can if you had unlimited time. The thing that restricts you is the clock. That's what restricts you. So we have to, people say, well, manage time. It, 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 you're not going to manage it. You manage yourself. Mm. Yeah, you don't manage the time because the time you have no control over Okay. Each second that passes, you have no, I can't manage that. I can't say, okay, can I hold it there, please? No, you can't. Right. You manage yourself. And the way you manage yourself is to be effective within the time that you have. I'm not saying work 24 seven. You need to enjoy yourself. You need downtime. You need to sleep. You need to have fun. You need to laugh. You need to just relax. But when you're in the zone of working, is the time that you're working effective time? The best way that you become effective is to invest in your brain and make sure your scripts are powerful and effective. The only way you do that is rehearse. Rehearse, practice. Are you getting in front of a mirror? Are you recording yourself? Are you recording your phone conversations with your customers? This is what you have to do. And do you have something to offer? Do you have something that blows away the customer? Do you have things that not other, that not a lot of other people have? I don't want to say nobody else has because sure. other people are going to also be sharp. But are you a leader? Are you one of the ones that people point to and say, man, there, that person's great. I was just blown away by that phone conversation. Not because you offered a low rate, but because you literally changed their life and their perspective of using a mortgage, not as a commodity, like you're buying a flat screen TV, but using the mortgage as an enormous financial tool to create wealth with, because it is. So on, on that note, you said earlier about being an advisor, and I can't help but notice that you're wearing a CMA shirt right now, which I know, you know, is a program that you're uh, extremely proud of. So it's, you know, we probably have some folks that are listening to this podcast that either maybe haven't heard of CMA or, the, or they're not CMA. And I'm sure there's a lot of CMAers out there that are enjoying um, your content as well. But give us a little, um, and, and I think we have a promo code too that we'll, we'll give here at the end, but give us just a quick rundown on, on CMA and, and uh, how it might help somebody in this environment. So it's investing in your brain. None of the other uh, educational programs are like CMA. Now, all education is important, but remember with the word effective, right? So mm -hmm. CMA will make you the most effective because it will allow you to understand what drives the markets. And, and look, I... Uh, 
in, I did $2.1 billion of mortgage applications in my career. Okay? It was just me and one assistant. I have a team under me and my assistant. Uh, so when we did that, I never had one customer say to me, okay, Barry, uh, whatever it says in that box that shows rate, just put whatever you want in there. I don't care about that. <laughs> right. Everybody asked me, should I lock? Should I flow? What's the sure. rate going to do? What do you think? Uh, you know, and, and some people here, oh man, if I knew the answer to that, I would... that's a bad answer. You have just been given an opportunity to showcase your intelligence and rise above everybody else. If people are saying, is this market overheated? Is it a good idea to purchase this home? Should I bid up? How do you address and answer those things? Learning the things you learn within CMA mm. will allow you to be much more effective and scripted because we teach you everything from technical analysis, which you can use for yourself to create personal. Everybody loves the module on technical analysis. And yeah. here's a spoiler alert. What we're doing behind the scenes that you guys know of is, is, is amazing because technical analysis is great if I'm teaching it to you. But how about if we get the people that taught me, like people like Steve Nissen, who is one of who was the, the man who brought Japanese candlestick charting to the United States, who was one of my mentors, who everybody reads his book. He's he's written the Bible on technical analysis as far as Eastern technical signals. Why don't we get him to start teaching it for CMA? And we did, and that's coming. And then if you turn on CNBC, who is the most widely known technical analyst out there? It's on CNBC and all the other networks. It's Katie Stockton. So how about if we get Katie to do a live session with us that we can send out to everybody who's on CMA? So if you really want to understand technical analysis, let's not just get it from what I've been fortunate enough to learn. And heck, we are very good at it, but let's take it to the next level which is something that we want to try and strive to do at CMA always. And you know, you want to, you hear the Fed mentioned every day. Do you really understand the Fed or it's just yeah. you're parroting what they say? You, you hear about inflation. Do you understand why inflation affects rates? You hear about these economic reports. Why are they important? How can you explain that to your customer? You want to understand the housing market. There are so many different aspects. The mortgage bond market, how does it work? Where does mortgage money come from? Does it rain one day and you've got mortgage paper out there? Where does it how does it get sold? Where's it got? You would think that somebody in the mortgage business would know this stuff, but nobody does. Yeah. But the people who do will be head and shoulders above their competition. That's what this is about, team. This is about winning and doing good and feeling good about what you do. Magic about this is that not only will you do more, not only will you look better than your competition, not only will people seek you out and want to work with you, not only will you make a lot more money, and I mean a lot more money, but you gain fulfillment because you're so proud of what you're doing. You're not, as you said, Shay, you're not taking orders. Right. You're advising well, and changing people's life for the better and adding value. I want to add into that, better. Barry. It also gives people like me confidence because we are in such a tumultuous time. And, and I think one of the things that you thought of that you kept kind of talking around was this entrepreneurship that you have in your life. You know, you saw a problem, you saw friction, you created a way to solve the friction. CMA solves friction and it gives you confidence and it's a differentiator in the market. And we need that now more than ever before. So gang, if you have not taken an opportunity to dive into CMA, he already gave you some spoiler alerts, which it's, it's going to be some amazing new content coming out. But this is a market differentiator course that gives you confidence to lead in any market. Who doesn't want that? Shane, I love what you said because you know how many times I hear from people that they can, if, if I have a customer who's, you know, smart and starts asking me these questions, I get intimidated. I mm -hmm. back off. I kind of try and joke around. I try and dance around. If that's you and you're listening, please understand that if they talk to somebody else when they're shopping and that next person is able to take an intelligent individual and teach that intelligent customer about what's going on, they're going to win the deal uh, every time you want to be that intelligent advisor that impresses even the most intelligent of consumers so that you can win more deals and be head and show. And then everybody points to you and says, what you got to deal with them because they know what they're doing. And, and that's, that's how you continue to win. That's See, awesome. the, remember, take what the defense gives you. What's a big point of friction for us? Well, FinTech, FinTech's got a lot of money. They got a lot of advertising, but what is the defense giving us here? FinTech does not have this level of expertise. They're typically headset jockeys that are going to take orders based upon what's out there, whether it's good for the customer or not. And what we are able to do is we are able to say, okay, they may be giving you a little bit better rate, but we are exponentially going to change your life. Maybe the rate's slightly higher, 
but you're going to want our advice not just for this loan but for the next loan you're doing as to the timing when what you could do how you're going to structure your debts as your life changes anybody here is listening is your life the same as it was three years ago more than likely not your customer's life will be different three years from now that headset jockey is not going to be able to advise them how to best take care of what they're going to need to take so care of in the right. future yeah. prove to them that you can and be there for them not just today but with the next term loan too Boy, that, that's so true. That is so true. And I'll tell you, you know, having uh, a lot of my team uh, go through CMA as well as just reading the reviews and everything, it's just, you know, people just love it. And, uh, you know, I, the two things, the two ones that always stick out to me are they have a love hate with the candlesticks, right? It's like, it's, it's, it's complex stuff. I mean, it's not a, it's not a cakewalk. It's really going to teach you how to understand these things, but they love it. They love the knowledge. And the other one that's a little funny that always comes through is, um, you know, it is we, we reveal the truth behind APR and Barry does a phenomenal job of breaking it down. And people go, I always knew it was garbage, but I could never pinpoint exactly why. And Barry cleared it up for me. And uh, yeah. So listen, if you're if you haven't had an opportunity to go through that, then uh, now's can the I time. touch on those two, Kellen, because sure. I'm so glad you brought them up. So the, the let's go backwards. So the the APR one is is really important because that's how fintech beats you. They're very smart. Yep. They're very clever and they manipulate APR legally in order to present the wrong option for a customer in a way that makes it look more appealing. It is smoke and mirrors and it is hurting the customer, but the customer is swallowing it hook, line and sinker and say, oh no, that's APR. That's what, but APR is a horrible way of looking at it. And if you don't understand that you're at a big disadvantage and if you do, you gain tremendous advantage, confidence, growth. And what you also do is you show that customer why they should stay away from the fintech company, why they're trying to just manipulate mm -hmm. them. That shedding the light on something that is pretty dark. It's not just dark for the customer. Everyone's in the dark on APR, not just the customer in the mortgage industry. Ask somebody if they really understand it. I'll bet you the vast majority do not, but yet we quote it every day. We disclose it every day. People sign papers every day, but sure. nobody understands it. And fintech is smart enough to, to know that and play upon that. They're taking what the defense is giving you. They're taking the ignorance of the mortgage professional and the ignorance of the consumer to make something that's garbage look like ice cream. That's what they're doing. <laughs> so you have to be smarter. Now, you also mentioned about the candlestick charts and the fact that, yeah, this is not, this is, look, if it's simple, everybody could do it. Thank yeah. God it's a little bit more difficult. Absolutely. Thank God it's, you don't want to hear what you already know. You want to grow your mind. You want to expand it. You want to be smarter. You want to have something of value. So yes, you do have to earn that and go through it. And, and I think all of these things really, again, go back to alleviating points of friction, whether it be in our own mind or what, whatever it is, these are all critical things that in order for us to grow, in order for us to go through that S-curve, the easiest way to do it is expanding our mind. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Well, listen, we've uh, we've had an awesome show. Thank you, Barry, for being here. Uh, man, what an honor it is just to hear more about kind of what's happening in the market and, and, and hearing and learning more about CMA. And we, we are big endorsers of that. And listen, if you're listening and you're not a current uh, CMA member and you want to go through the process of getting that certification and becoming uh, that thought leader in your market and creating a distinct advantage over the other loan officers in your market, you can head on over to becomecma.com. Again, that's becomecma.com. And we've got a special promo code uh, for this uh, podcast and it's CMA1597. So the normal price is nineteen ninety seven dollars uh, for listening to this podcast today and joining us. You get $400 off that price and you get instant access. So if, uh, if you want to sign up, you get immediate access. You can start going through that uh, immediately and getting that certification done. Well, thank you guys, Barry. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for being here. Shane, thanks for uh, joining me in the studio today. I appreciate you and uh, all the listeners out there. Have an awesome week. We'll see you thanks, soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks.